our online workshop to launch research papers on countering hate speech. It is, as I say, a delight to have you on this April afternoon, which at least here in Vienna has been uh, rainy and sunny by turns. My name is Frances Rose. I'm program manager in the Europe region at KAISEED, and I'm very pleased to have you with us. A brief technical announcement before we begin. As you've just noticed, we are recording this meeting, partially for internal purposes and partially because we hoped that we can publish sections of it, the first section, the, the plenary, um, on YouTube later on. Anyone who has concerns about that, please express them. Otherwise, we will continue um, with the recording. This event has been organized by the International Dialogue Center, CAISID, and the European Council for Religious Leaders, Religions for Peace Europe, with the generous support of the OSCE's Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, that's the ODEA. It's part of the Countering Hate Speech Project, which the partners began back in 2021. And that in turn is part of our social cohesion initiative, which CAISID is pursuing in Europe. Our overall aims are that by convening dialogues among different sectors and by producing materials to support policy decisions and building the capacity of different actors, we can contribute to a diverse and inclusive and peaceful society in which people of many different identities, spiritual or otherwise, feel at home in Europe. The partners recognize that hate speech is a fundamentally destructive phenomenon and counteractive to social cohesion of every kind, as well as to the principles of democratic society. We note that much of it is directed at ethnic and religious minorities, among them refugees and migrants. But we also note that faith-based and migrant-led initiatives are energetic and creative in counteracting hate speech, and that they have insights which mean that they really can and should play a significant role in initiatives to counter hate speech wherever they originate. Uh, today, we are very glad to have the opportunity to review with you two research papers. These were commissioned last year, and they're designed to showcase and explore work which faith-based organizations in particular have been doing in Europe over the last five years uh, on countering hate speech of different kinds. They draw on more than 30 different interviews and many consultations. And some of you may have already attended some of those and remember the last year's expert consultation and consultations with religious leaders. We are extremely grateful to all of you who've contributed to these research papers and to those of you who've attended the meetings, especially of course to our authors who uh, hopefully will later on present their work and we look forward to hearing from them again. Looking forward to the future, CAISEED and ECRL and our supporter ODEA, we are keen to ensure that this knowledge base um, is built upon and that the challenges that this, these papers identify and the recommendations which will come from these papers in some degree, but also from the conversations we hold now, can be accessible and can be used to make sure that countering hate speech initiatives become stronger, and particularly that the coalitions between sectors become more confident, because we feel that is extremely important as a means to improve the, the projects underway. Um, without further ado, in order to introduce this event and to welcome you all, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce the heads of CAISID and ECRL, beginning with Elham Ashejni, our Interim Deputy Secretary General at CAISID International Dialogue Center. Elham, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Francis. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished partners and dear friends, welcome and thank you for joining us at this online workshop on the outcomes of our research on countering hate speech. We have conducted these studies due to the sharp rise in hate speech and hate crimes in Europe and on the backdrop of an often divisive political and social environment. During COVID-19, we witnessed the proliferation of hate speech, misinformation and disinformation amplified on digital platforms and a huge number of instances of hate speech against women and girls, which is yet another manifestation of gender-based violence, all which threaten global peace. Alarmingly, over the past few years, we also watched and witnessed hatred and misinformation fuel the largest armed conflict in Europe in decades. As extremely popular channels for hate speech are allowing harmful content to reach wider audiences, we too need to step our responses, and we can do this more efficiently if we work together. Imbued with the spirit of cooperation, the two research papers we're launching here today are key outcomes of the Countering Hate Speech Project, which was introduced last year by the International Dialogue Center, CAISID, 
together with the European Council of Religious Leaders, ECRL, and with the support of the OSCE's Office of Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, ODIA. The project investigates the causes of hate speech in Europe and promotes approaches to tackle the issue, as among which capacity building for religious leaders to equip them to better recognize and counter hate speech. Speaking on behalf of CAISID and our dear partners in this endeavor, we remain concerned that hate speech is a major issue causing division in Europe, driving misinformation, distrust, discrimination, and even violence, both on and offline. We commend the European Union's efforts to regulate content labeled as hate speech online, realizing that we need stronger frameworks and legislation in these areas. We also applaud the European Commission's initiative in December 2021 to propose the inclusion of hate speech and hate crimes on the list of EU crimes, namely under Article 83 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. While legislation, policy, and other frameworks have already been put in place by European actors as part of their efforts to address the problem, CAICID and its partners remain convinced of three important points. First, Dialogue among actors from different sectors of society is paramount for effective solutions in this field. Second, religious leaders and actors need to be part of the solution due to their influence in society and because religious identity is often a target for hate speech. And finally, coordinated implementation at many different levels is necessary to deal with hate speech effectively and to produce sustainable results in terms of social cohesion, prevention, and tackling gender, cultural, and religious stereotypes. Acknowledging how important research is for evidence-based policymaking, and in addressing the impact of hate speech, we seek to reflect through these research papers, the experiences and promising practices of religious actors working in several countries in Europe on various aspects of preventing and countering hate speech. The research papers focus on countering hate speech efforts, which include anti-refuge and migrant hate speech in Europe, and on the role of religious actors in combating hate speech. I applaud the efforts behind these papers, as around 30 interviews were carried out with leading European civil society organizations, including many faith-based organizations. The aim of these interviews was to support concerned stakeholders in building up resilient national infrastructures as the source of any state's commitment to human rights. I extend my gratitude to the authors of these papers, especially Dr. Frederic Smith and Ms. Olivia Quinn, who will address us later today, and of course, our partners ECRL and ODIR, from whom we continue to learn. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to hear the findings of the two papers and their promising proposed approaches to countering hate speech through different means. As we listen to the speeches of our distinguished guests and co contributors, I invite you to ask yourselves, how do these findings relate to the constantly changing status of hate speech in Europe? And how in 2022 would these findings help us to implement better and more inclusive projects to counter hate speech? To follow up on this initiative, I urge you to continue your own efforts to prevent such forms of discrimination through knowledge sharing, and action at all levels, combat discriminatory hate speech and mainstream gender. I hope that the ideas contained in the research papers, as well as today's discussions, will provide you and us with new ideas for how to work together. Let me conclude with CAISID's commitment to partner with concerned actors within our sphere in defense of tolerance and inclusive societies. We all, for example, continue to foster important convening spaces such as the, dial the, the European Dialogue uh, Forum for best practices to cross-pollinate and disseminate further. We will continue to invest resources in re relevant applied research in order to identify trends and patterns related to hate speech through our European program. We will also continue to develop toolkits to support sensitive issues such as migration. And in 2022, Specifically, cities, the primary site of interaction between minority groups, including refugees and migrants, will be the focus of our European region program. 
As we lead, this space inspired and better informed by the two publications, we count on each of you in supporting us in tackling the effects of hate speech. And it is our joint responsibility to rid our societies of hatred and fear and embrace the full potential of humanity united in diversity. Thank you so much. And I look forward to our discussions. Thank you, Elham, for beginning this conversation with such an urgent appeal to us all. And of course, also for reminding us that this time and this year, the partners are keen to look at cities and urban level interactions, which we see as being the primary nexus, if you like, of encounter between many different sectors and authorities. And we are extremely keen to continue to work with diverse actors in order to help initiatives at urban level. Thank you. Um, I would like now to invite Reverend Dr. Thomas Vip, President of the European Council of Religious Leaders, to also offer his welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Excellencies, dear friends, uh, I'm pleased to greet you on behalf of the European Council of Religious Leaders, part of the new founded Association Religions for Peace Europe. Underlining the strong and helpful introduction words of Madam Secretary General, I would like to start by thanking the staff of KAISIT Europe Desk for organizing this workshop and especially the authors of the two research papers on countering hate speech. The studies report indeed valuable results, best practices and conclusions about the role of education in countering hate speech within society and about the role of religious actors. Related to religious actors, um, dear friends, uh, allow me to point out, and we must never ignore this, religious actors are unfortunately sometimes among the per perpetrators of hate speech. We must always seriously consider this in order to remain humble. No religious tradition is exempt from this, especially if they are not careful enough with the concept of truth or absolute truth of the respective dogmas, or when religion is abused and instrumentalized politically, ideologically, and nationalistically. We don't have to look far for current examples of this, unfortunately, and we have to talk about and to take it in account. When we talk to each other about topics like today's workshops, we all should always be guided by self-criticism and humility. On the other hand, it's crucial that we take the insights and takeaways from the two studies very seriously and discuss them in depth. That's why I'm so grateful that so many committed and competent colleagues from all over Europe are doing this in today's workshop. It will encourage us to introduce these questions and approaches to solutions wherever we work. Because we gathered today are probably more of a group of people who are aware of the topic of hate speech offline and online. But how do we reach those people for whom, not out of bad will or ignorance, this is even less the case? Um, I, it's, it's always important that we don't talk and discuss in kind of a bubble. I close with the concern that I have often allowed myself to point out in the introduction to one of the studies, there is the sentence, many European nations are struggling with how to mitigate anti-refugee and anti-migrant hate speech. This statement is of course true. 
but the phenomenon of hate speech is much more comprehensive and complex in terms of cause, causes, drivers, and victims. It is often not the case that hate speech exists in one direction only. Maybe we should consider that and take also a more holistic approach. That is, and it's important for me to state this, that is already the case in other parts of the studies, and I'm grateful for that, and it was also included in the words of the Secretary General, the more holistic approach. Once again, I would like to, to thank all of you, dear participants, also on behalf of ECRL, for sharing your ex expertise and experience to help find ways to overcome this terrible and growing reality of the often hidden hate speech. And finally, allow me to add the personal side note that due to another commitment, I can only follow the first part of the workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Vip. And we are very grateful to have you with us and of course ECRL's support uh, for any part of this event, but also in general throughout the project that we're running. We very much value all of the experience which you and which your colleagues bring. Thank you very much for pointing out uh, the role of religion, which can be of course both negative and positive and places a great responsibility on our shoulders. And of course, for underlining the two-way approach when it comes to respect, uh, integration and other important themes where two groups meet, of course, two hands must be extended. Um, bearing in mind that, of course, hate speech, unfortunately, is an extremely dynamic topic and we are seeing current conflicts and tensions which change as fast as the geopolitical scene. Um, it's a great pleasure, but also uh, it's, with, it's a solemn necessity to introduce the first of our panels, uh, our opening panel discussion, where I hope we will be welcoming uh, experts who are both very knowledgeable about the theory, but also the practice of countering hate speech. Um, I am very pleased to invite Dr. Alexandra Jurek, a project manager for Network for Dialogue at CAISEED, uh, to moderate the exchange. And I'm very glad and grateful that our speakers will be joining us to give us, if you like, a context for these papers, which we are about to hear from later. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Um, as you mentioned, I have a pleasure to moderate this uh, panel discussion today. Um, and I would like to uh, briefly uh, underline something that was already mentioned, I believe, but I think it is important to stress and to frame a bit the panel discussion and to provide introduction also for our speakers today. As we could hear, the hate speech continues to be a problem, uh, to be a problem stoking violence in different contexts and different actors, religious groups, educators, media, governments are all interested in working against the problem due to the dark consequences it can have for peace and security, as well as trust and participation in democratic processes. Everything needed for social cohesion and the maintenance of the European Ethnos of unity in diversity. The papers that we are launching today particularly uh, looked particularly into the role of two sectors, education and religious or faith-based organizations across Europe. As experts who have an eye in one of both of these sectors, we would like to hear from uh, our speakers today about their assessment on the situation concerning hate speech in Europe and where do they think future efforts and partnerships need to be uh, concentrated, particularly at the urban level, which is where the organi organizers plan to place their efforts in the future. So I would like to invite our distinguished speakers who joined us today to give us our, uh, their thoughts for some five to seven minutes on the question, where is the struggle against hate speech in 2022? What trends demand the focus of European actors in the future? I believe that we will also have some time for questions from the audience. So I already now mentioned this to our participants and encourage you to post your questions in the chat. 
and I hope we will have some time to uh, take these questions towards the end of the interventions of our two speakers today. And I have the pleasure to invite our first speaker, which is Professor Regina Polak, who is a personal representative of the OSCE's chairperson in office on combating racism, xenophobia and discrimination. And she's also head of the Department for Practical Theology at the Catholic Theological Faculty of the University of Vienna. Professor Pollock, it is our pleasure to have you today and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this kind introduction of, of mine. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, I really want to thank you for inviting me to this very important workshop, which discusses a deep rooted complex and multidimensional phenomenon. And I also want to congratulate on the impressive research you present today. As I'm a researcher myself, I know how important uh, such empirical studies are. They are an important fundament for developing evidence-based policies and tools to combat hate speech. Hate speech can take many dangerous forms and can frequently be a precursor to violent acts. Hate speech negatively affects individuals, groups, and societies. It instills fear and humiliation and threatens social cohesion and democracy. In the times of multiple and cumulative crises we will face in the context of, context of the years to come, the widespread increase of hate speech through the internet is one of the most severe dangers also for human rights. It may result in an increase of hate crimes, which I want to focus on now because the participating states of the OSCE do not have a definition or a common policy on hate speech, but they all have committed to combat hate crimes in several declarations and through a broad portfolio of means and tools based on a whole of government approach. According to the OSCE, hate crimes are defined as criminal acts motivated by bias or prejudice towards particular groups of people and thus always comprise two elements, a criminal offense, and the bias motivation. Bias motivations can be defined as prejudice, intolerance, or hatred directed at a particular group sharing a common identity trait, such as, for instance, race, ethnicity, language, religion, nationality, sexual orientation, disability, gender, or any other identity traits. When a perpetrator has intentionally targeted an individual or property because of one or more identity traits, or expressed hostility towards these identity traits during the crime, one can speak of a hate crime. As representative of the OSCE, I will now therefore focus on the challenges on countering and combating hate crimes and highlight some trends and tasks that demand the focus of European actors in the future, with a particular focus on religious leaders and communities as indispensable partners for the OSCE. A clear and whole of government policy on combating hate crimes can also be or is one of the most powerful signals and tools against the rise of hate speech. In its latest hate crime report, <clears throat> published in November 2021, two main challenges were identified. First, more action needs to be taken to increase knowledge of the true number of hate crimes committed. And second, more victim support is needed. Despite many countries across the OSCE have been taking greater efforts to combat hate crimes, most of them still remain unreported, unrecorded, and unprosecuted. The recording mechanisms often are inadequate and do not identify the bias motivation behind those crimes. And because of this failure of too many states, victims can neither be protected nor enjoy full access to justice and receive tailored specialist support. Therefore, from the OSCE perspective, two main tasks must get more attention by the countries. First, the mechanisms to collect data and record hate crimes must be improved, which includes raising awareness about the special nature and increasing the capacities of criminal justice officials to recognize, to record, to investigate, and to prosecute hate crimes effectively. And second, which is also true for hate speech, victim support systems must be strengthened, 
which includes a closer cooperation with civil society organizations that can often offer the most specialized and direct support to the victims. Regarding both tasks, religious leaders and communities can play an important key role. Mr. Whip already referred to the ambivalent role of religion. I want to highlight three of the positive possibilities I see and should be strengthened both in terms or with regard to hate crimes and to hate speech. First, religious leaders as public stakeholders do have a lot of influence both on their believers and within society. Thus, they can raise awareness for vulnerable persons and groups and the problem of hate speech and hate crime. And they can also publicly promote a culture of human rights underlying them with religious values such as human dignity, equality of human beings and tolerance while respecting the, respecting the freedom of expression. They can also openly criticize and condemn hate speech and hate crimes. And moreover, they can remind politicians and governments to fulfill their commitments. They can encourage civil society to commonly combat hate speech and hate crimes and most important, they can express solidarity with the victims, both in public uh, and, and on the community level. Second, as an as essential part of civil society, religious communities can and should be supported to both recognize, collect and record hate crimes to the OSCE and prevent hate crimes by building coalitions with other civil society organizations and cooperate and coordinate between them and other stakeholders on hate crime and hate speech issues. Religious communities also have the resources to protect victims and to offer tailored support. Of course, to be capable of these responsible contributions, the members of religious communities need education themselves and training. And third, Religious leaders and communities can provide several valuable comp contributions to prevent hate speech and hate crimes. They can help to explore, to address, and to identify the roots of hate speech and hate crimes, such as, for instance, disinformation, stereotyping, stigmatization of individuals and groups. And they can also name and deal with the deeper spiritual roots of hate and evil they can contribute to awareness raising and they can foster values such as tolerance, solidarity, justice, and the willingness to support victims in their public speeches, in their internet resources, in the media, and in their own education programs. By developing counter and alternative narratives, which is something that religious communities and religious leaders are experts of, they can offer space and time for intercultural and interreligious dialogue, and they can help by this to create a societal atmosphere of tolerance, non-discrimination, and the acceptance of human rights. The importance of religious actors for societies shaped by democracy, the rule of law, and the acceptance of human rights cannot be overestimated. To support European actors, civil society organizations, including religious actors in their efforts to combat hate speech and hate crimes, ODIA provides a wide range of practical resources and tools to make their capacities fruitful. Okay. If you look at the respective homepage, hate crime uh, 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 homepage of the OSCE, you can find hate crime reports, you can find fact sheets, hate crime programs, several guides, and also offers for trainings related to identify hate crimes, as well as you can find tools on how to support victims uh, and to strengthen uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the capacity and the competence to support them uh, in a, a holistic uh, approach. The OSCE stands ready to support everyone who wants to join this challenge. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the other speakers and to the workshops where we can identify such collaborations. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Professor Pollack, uh, for very important insights from the perspective of OSCE on combating hate crime, <clears throat> and also for underlying the uh, the role of religious leaders and uh, religious communities in that process, and mentioning the useful tools that ODIR is offering to support combating hate crime. So this was really uh, helpful and useful, I believe, for most of our participants to learn more about, um, about possibilities. Um, without further ado, I would like to continue with our next speaker. Uh, hopefully we will have some time uh, for questions towards the end. Uh, but I would like to introduce our next speaker, Mariana uh, Vort Horen, who is a chair of Multicolored Colored Religions of Rotterdam Foundation. Mariana, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for joining. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, and also, I would like to join the previous speakers on congratulating you uh, on the important and thorough research papers which are presented today, um, addressing such a complex issue with, with so many aspects as have already been mentioned. Um, Dr. Wipf already justly, I think, called for humility. Uh, and uh, I would say that not only applies to religious organizations in, in this discussion, but also for me personally, uh, in this program this uh, afternoon, um, I feel humble in this distinguished uh, company um, uh, on what I can add to the discussion. So, but my perspective is coming from a Dutch perspective and more specifically also a local perspective in the, in the city of Rotterdam. And I just would like to share some thoughts and experiences very briefly uh, as uh, for introduction. And I hope there will be time uh, as uh, you, the, the moderator already mentioned for, uh, for some interaction and afterwards. Um, so we were asked the questions, you know, what, what trends uh, demand our focus and, and which actors should be involved. Um, I also think that it's very important, maybe to start with that, that there, that uh, you know, there is a whole chain of response. When we talk about hate speech, there are so many aspects involved uh, that you really need a whole chain of response to it. So there is, there is the you know, the registration, there is the legal side of it, but also prevention. And in the work that I do, um, I really try to focus on prevention and on the broader narratives that uh, really fuel uh, the hate speech. Um, so when we talk about trends. I've, I've really, I thought about this in, in, in preparing my contribution for today. And um, I really find it hard to say what, you know, what is a specific trend because uh, I think that, uh, um, and this is maybe stating the obvious, but hate speech, the mechanism is the same throughout the ages. So when we are faced with uncertainty, with stress, with duress, we tend to, as human beings, unfortunately, we tend to lash out and you know, blame the other, whoever that other is. And when we look at the very, so in, in different times and in different places, you know that it can have a different face, but the mechanism is the same. Um, and for example, when we look at the current situation now in the Netherlands recently, uh, tragically, we had hate speech, but also hate uh, really violent incidents uh, against people of Russian descent uh, or who are perceived as being Russian uh, because of the war in Ukraine. So um, uh, this is also, yeah, I, I find it very, very tragic to see that. Um, um, in my, my, my main concern when I look at the Dutch context, is uh, as I stated uh, very clearly in one of the papers, there is you know there's very explicit uh, explicit hate speech when it's very clear that it's against a certain group, but sometimes it's more subtle and it really also depends on the historical context and certain words that are used, which may not be explicitly hateful, but do fuel hate speech and certain negative stereotypes. And my main concern in the Dutch context is really with that. And I see that over the years in, in politics, both uh, national and, and local politics, there is a more, um, this, this subtle hate speech um, uh, is, is, is growing. Um, for example, we had a lot of uh, discussions recently about politicians using the word tribunal. 
They said after the elections, there will be tribunals uh, uh, to, to their colleague uh, politicians. And uh, of, you can say tribunal, well, it's, you know, it's a general word for a kind of court, but it's not because it's in, at least in a Dutch context, I don't know how, what it's like in your countries, but it's really only used in a very specific context of where courts held after the Second World War against uh, really um, uh, people who had committed war crimes. So, you know, sort of threatening someone with tribunals is really um, uh, also fueling, fueling hatred. Um, so there is, I, I, I'm really concerned about this roughness in the political discourse, which is again also then um, uh, repeated or, you know, translated in the other online and offline discourse. On the other hand, I always find it uh, important to add a hope, uh, a note of hope. When we just had last March, we had the elections for the local level for the city councils. And uh, it, it, especially at the uh, local level, uh, parties who may be at the uh, complete opposite uh, side of the political specter uh, and who fight each other may are now forced to work together and to compromise. Here in Rotterdam, for example, we see there is a livable Rotterdam, which is really a quite explicit anti-Islam agenda. And they're forced to cooperate and they're leading the, the, the coalition, the, the, the negotiations for a new coalition with a party called DENK. Uh, which is really its, its main voters are from Muslim background. So it will be interesting to see, you know, at the local level, in the end, we have to work together. So on the one hand, I think that's hopeful. So you, when you incorporate these, all these voices in the political system, they are forced to compromise, to work together. On the other hand, this is for me a dilemma. Do you really want to incorporate that kind of language in your political system? So where is the balance there? There's maybe something that we can talk about. Now, when it comes to uh, actors that should be involved. I think a lot of also has been said very important things. Um, my focus and experience also that I think uh, is uh, important on local uh, administration governments working together with faith-based organizations. And I see there are differences there between cities in the Netherlands. So there's also depends on the political vision, uh, but there are really opportunities in this cooperation, each in their own role. And for example, in Rotterdam recently, the a majority of the city council, council ex, actually accepted um, sort of assignment they give then to the administration saying that there should be a program in promoting the acceptance of religious diversity in the city. Um, this is again, a note of hope, I would say. I think this is uh, very uh, positive, but also depending when you talk about narratives and, and um, uh, prevention, I think uh, working together with in, uh, institutes of arts, uh, arts and, and education to find creative forms in, in creating the narratives is very important. But also I always stress for faith-based organizations to be involved in the issues at hand. For example, fighting poverty, uh, fighting racism, fighting loneliness, um, uh, also the climate change. Uh, in Rotterdam, we will be organizing a big demonstration, uh, you know, for sustainability and fighting climate change. Uh, and there will be uh, an integral part of this will be an interface service. Uh, so with people from different religious backgrounds uh, will be a part of this event. And I think it's very important also just to, to be there because these are the issues that people are concerned about and that fuel the distress, the, the, the duress, uh, et cetera, that can in, in turn fuel uh, hate speech. Um, so I think it's um, just some closing remarks. It's very important to really organize people from different backgrounds, meeting each other, organizing the dialogue, because it doesn't always spontaneously happen. The local level is the, you know, the best level for that really, because we live together in the cities and the villages, et cetera. And maybe also to close, uh, to close with a question for now. So we talk about hate speech, but what is the alternative? So we talk about what we do not, not want, but what do we want? So maybe that is love speech then, I don't know, maybe there is another term for them, but also, you know, let's talk about that with each other. What do we want and how can we promote that? So I would like to, uh, uh, th th these are the thoughts I would like to share for now. And I hope there's time for interaction then. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mariana, for bringing uh, Dutch perspective, also from bringing the local perspective, which we underlined several times during the introduction, how important this is, especially implementing phase. 
And this is what we hope to achieve with the research papers that we are launching today, that uh, this can lead to the use of these papers at the local level, especially knowing that uh, in these research papers, we have a new number of organizations included that which operate um, in a single city. Uh, so some, somehow this is really important link for us to, uh, to, bring, uh, to bring papers to this implementation and phase of use uh, by different communities, uh, policymakers and stakeholders. Holders. Um, unfortunately, as I have been announced here, we are running out of time for any kind of follow-up questions at this segment, but since we are going to have time in breakout uh, rooms uh, later on, I do believe that there will be time for more interaction in smaller groups. Uh, at this point, I would like to thank uh, to our speakers today and to stress that we are looking forward uh, to hearing the views of other experts and practitioners during the breakout sessions. Uh, but first, before we go to breakout sessions, we will uh, follow the presentation of the research papers. And I would like now to hand over back to Francis uh, to announce the, another segment of this introduction. Uh, thank you very much once again, Francis. Thank you so much, Alexandra, and thank you very much to our speakers. Uh, yes, we look forward to actually having a conversation uh, in the next phase. Beforehand, though, we're very, very pleased to invite our two authors of our papers who put a lot of hard work in last year to present their work briefly to us. Um, beginning with Olivia Quinn, founder of ESG Collective, which is a boutique social and environmental consultancy. Olivia Quinn is the author of Using Education to Counter Anti-Refugee and Migrant Hate Speech in Europe. Olivia, if you're ready, I'd be, be delighted to hear about your findings. Yes, absolutely. And I hope everyone can hear me well. And it's a pleasure to be here today and revisit this work that we did last year and bring it into the urban context, which a lot of you have been speaking about. And while the research wasn't developed with the urban lens, as I was going back through it, I think some of the recommendations become hopefully more achievable, achievable when we look at smaller contexts and we look at a city or a regional level. So just to provide a little bit of context before I go into some of the findings, um, I worked on a piece of research with Kaiseed on how education can counter anti-refugee and anti-migrant hate speech in Europe. And we looked both at a European level and then also at several specific um, country contexts. Obviously we couldn't cover the whole of, of the continent, but we did look at diverse backgrounds and we looked um, at what different faith-based organizations are doing across faith, across denomination. And our goal was really to understand what is happening currently, um, how it's being offered, and also how successful or the impact that it's having on countering hate speech, both in educating populations and the impact it's having on the people that we're speaking about, the, the refugees, the migrants, and the newcomers uh, to the European context. And we did try to look at the different ways that this was being offered across different programming. And I'll give you a little bit of context, which is that we looked at six different ways that programming is being offered at the moment. So we looked at things like fostering encounters between host communities and refugees. We looked at things like advocacy, both faith-based and traditional advocacy. Um, we looked at uh, holistic inclusion. We looked at anti-bias training and reporting. So how do we correct some of those elements? Um, and each of these provided insight into how the programming is being offered. But one of our challenges that we looked at when we were doing this research and when we engaged with different organizations as well, that there's a lot of different programming in place, there is a gap in the way that um, organizations are looking at who they're targeting. So one of the main findings that, um, we came, that came out of this research is that while there's different approaches to how education is being offered, there has not been enough focus on who we're targeting across the spectrum of European populations, be that people who are potentially more sympathetic to newcomers and just need to counter some of the negative stereotyping, be that to something what we call the movable middle, um, and also to far right groups, to extremist groups, to radical groups who are in many cases the ones who are promoting some of the, the more detrimental hate speech or the more focused hate speech as was mentioned before. There's subtle hate speech, there's, there's um, negative stereotypes and then there's full anti-immigration or anti-refugee propaganda that's coming across. So one of the things that we looked at is that there needs to be a better focus on how we offer programming 
who we're targeting and what's the objective of that. So is it educating people about the legal context of hate speech, you know, and understanding what's legal, what's not legal, what's covered? Is it trying to um, have positive narratives to understand the impact that newcomers can have on our societies, be that diversity or economics? Or is it really to try to counter some of those belief systems and shift um, the dialogue in, in the more extreme groups? Um, and a, a second finding that we focused on in quite a lot of detail is that, and I'm sure many of you also um, have come across this in your work, is that there is a gap or an absence of clear policy around how education is being offered to counter hate speech. And I think someone mentioned earlier that hate speech is in, by no means something new to our context. It just unfortunately targets different populations or different groups or is triggered by different drivers at the particular moment. But what we really um, realizes there's not enough from a public sector or a governmental level, from a regional government level, from education bodies, there is not enough coverage of, of who should be governing um, education, who should be developing education, and how um, the roles and the responsibilities can be divided. And one of our findings was that often faith-based organizations are the ones who are offering this training, developing this training, but that there hasn't been a formal agreement of whether this is a governmental responsibility, whether this is a faith-based organization responsibility, whether this is civil society. So that we have serious challenges in who is developing curriculum, who's offering programming, and what they're actually aiming to achieve through it. If we go down to another level, and I know that in this context, we're looking at the urban context, there's a real gap in schools. And I think across all the interactions that we had, both in research and the interviews and the case studies, there was an acknowledgement that if we are going to work to, to counter hate speech, it has to start early. It has to be multidimensional. We have to have tolerance training. We have to have better understanding of what it means to be a citizen in the European context. We need to have a better acknowledgement of Europe's um, colonial legacy, slave trade legacy, it, 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 the interaction with current um, wars and conflicts and how that leads to refugee pr production from so many countries that are now entering Europe. And that this being introduced in schools is a very, very important way of addressing hate speech. So we can do a lot of this corrective work. We can work with law enforcement. We can do anti-bias. We can train in the workplace. But if we're not starting at the school level, we run a serious risk in not being able to target the drivers of hate speech and not be able to, to target at the sort of core educational level. And then one of the last things that was very, very important across this was that we saw a serious gap in knowledge sharing, in measurement, in research happening at the entity level. So the, the different faith-based organizations, the civil society entities, even the government initiatives, that there wasn't enough collaboration, that very few entities felt like they had resources, learnings, lessons from their other practitioners that was able to help them strengthen their programming to understand what was working, what was effective, where there was potential risks or challenges. So these are the, some of the major areas that came off the back of this research that we wanted to open up to all the, the people in the room or in this session today around how can we tackle some of those areas at an urban level? Where is there a policy question that needs to be discussed? Where is there curriculum? How can there be better resources and libraries for sharing information? But also very importantly, measuring how effective anti-hate speech education is. Who are we targeting? Are we leaving out some of the populations who are most responsible for hate speech? Are we speaking to, in a sense, preaching to the converted, the people who are more sympathetic to these causes? And that's one of the main findings that came out of this research and something that I think would be very useful in our, in our discussions in the breakout sessions as well. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you very much Thank for you. the exceptionally dense and, uh, and, and comprehensive view of your paper. And congratulations also on, on draw, what you've been able to draw out of the many, many interviews and the work you've been doing. Thank you. Thank um, you. Look forward also to hearing during the discussions afterwards more about how to build on this in terms of the urban uh, environment. But thank you for already beginning that process. Um, to join you, I'd like to invite Dr. Friederike Meet, who was the other author of the other paper. She's an independent researcher and the co-founder of Reflectory Consultancy. And Friederike has written not only the paper Religious Actors and Countering Hate Speech in Europe, but also a policy brief uh, on the same theme. And both of those will be put in the chat for your reference. Uh, Friederike, we look forward to hearing from you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Francis, for the introduction, and I hope everybody can hear me well. <clears throat> I have a little bit of a voice issue today. Uh, I'm really excited to be part of this round today uh, because also <clears throat> going through the research again, I realized how fast changing this topic also is, and it's so important for us to kind of stay on top of what is happening. And uh, my role today, or what I want to do today, is to summarize a little bit uh, the paper uh, that I wrote uh, last year. And um, the goal was a little bit more broad. It was about looking at what religious actors and faith-based organizations are doing uh, in the area of countering hate speech. So it's a little bit broader. And I uh, want to give you a little bit of an overview of the different areas uh, where religious actors and these organizations are um, active in order to help us uh, perhaps structure the conversation later on. So the research revealed um, the different areas in which uh, religious actors are active against hate speech. And um, the first uh, being uh, detection, uh, monitoring and reporting of hate speech. So these are kind of initiatives who want to raise awareness uh, about the issue of hate speech, what actually is hate speech on their own organizational level or in a, a regional level or on, on a country level. And uh, this is really important because in order to influence policy, we need data. We need to know what is happening, how much of it is happening. And especially uh, with the issue uh, like hate speech that is so complex and so difficult to define, it is always context dependent. So it's important that there are a lot of uh, mechanisms uh, are being tested and tried out how to um, create, uh, collect data on, on hate speech. And some of these initiatives also focus on training others, training religious actors or training other uh, secular actors on how to monitor and how to report hate speech. And this is happening both offline uh, in the real world, uh, reporting incidences in order to support uh, victims, but it also has to happen online so that we get a better understanding of, of what is happening there. A second large area uh, is something that we've called changing narratives. So this uh, <clears throat> includes initiatives who uh, focus on what organizations can do in the event when hate speech happens. So how do you respond to hate speech? So this is about counter speech campaigns, how to uh, correct information. Um, these includes initiatives who are developing positive narratives uh, in, in order to counter hate speech and to think about how what works in this area and how it has to be carried out. And here especially, we had uh, a lot of discussion at the EPDF conference last year about the role of media. That is a big gap uh, uh, there uh, because it's so important uh, in, in you know, both creating narratives but also fighting narratives. It is really important to, to look at what media and communication uh, agencies are doing there. So there is a big question mark uh, there. Uh, another area that I or that was revealed uh, by the research was uh, what I call education and training, but I need to separate it a little bit from the education that uh, Olivia has just talked about. Uh, here, I'll focus more on <clears throat> uh, sort of non-formal uh, education, such as increasing digital literacy. So this was a need that is absolutely uh, has been voiced by religious actors. Uh, but also in general, we need to think about how young people are learning to deal with uh, different media, uh, online and offline. And also in the context of uh, hate speech against religion, it is important to think about religious literacy. So what uh, does it actually mean to have a diverse society? What do uh, we understand among the different uh, religions and how, you know, how does that uh, play out? And again, here, there are some of the initiatives, they have um, provided information or they provide trainings uh, for other actors on these issues, on digital or religious literacy. Another important area is something that came from the research itself that uh, was a little bit unexpected, which I called identity and communication. Uh, and this is uh, something that um, particularly religious actors uh, have realized that in order to address hate speech, uh, it is important to actually learn and understand and strengthen one's own religious community. 
uh, so in order to work on the identity. And this is also uh, in response to that hate speech can also originate from religious uh, uh, communities. So here, working on identity also includes ways to uh, uh, work, to think about oneself in a positive way without um, talking down on others or without degrading other uh, groups in society. And some of these projects have been um, active in providing or doing this identity work, doing work with uh, religious scriptures, but also to provide guidance on good communication and how can I communicate well as a member of a certain community. And another uh, area uh, which has come forth was um, building cohesive societies. And this um, uh, is a category that describes initiatives uh, that focus more on the context of hate speech and on uh, preventing hate speech and also hate crime in the actual surroundings. Uh, so here it is um, organizations and initiatives who look in the holistic way uh, at their communities. Uh, for example, by uh, doing trust building activities between uh, religious groups or between religious groups and non-religious groups, or to um, look at uh, social and uh, economic issues in, in the uh, location where they are located and to fight this in order to prevent hate speech. Uh, finally, an issue that Cross cuts all of these categories uh, has been that of um, successful collaboration uh, across groups, but also across sectors. And uh, all of the successful initiatives portrayed in, in the research paper have been able to um, create good partnerships, impactful partnerships and collaborations. And um, this is really important. I'm going to close with this. Uh, it's really important uh, for two reasons. Uh, one reason is, um, is that, uh, and this many people have mentioned this today already, uh, with an issue such as, as complex as hate speech and where the causes of it are so, uh, let's say, diverse or so um, um, also complex, uh, it, it needs both a holistic approach, but also many different actors doing different things. Um, so that's, that's one, the, the importance of, of collaborating. And second, and that's also important to realize, it means that not everybody has to do everything, right? So it's not all of the uh, uh, organizations have to learn how to do all of these different activities, but it's rather a question of how we can do this smartly, how we can build smart collaborations and who would be best suited to be doing which activities. So these are some of the questions I would like to ask today. You know, what, what are the most impactful partnerships that you can think of or that would be needed uh, in terms of countering hate speech? Uh, but also what partnerships or what actors are missing uh, in a certain picture, in a certain geography? Uh, and again, here we come to the uh, context of media, but it could be man many, many other things depending on the location. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Friederike. It's really interesting and lovely to hear all over again, even though I was privileged to hear about your paper and of course to read it again. It's very refreshing to have these uh, arguments and these points remade. So thank you so much, both of you, uh, for refreshing all of our memories. Uh, thank you also again, possibly for chiming in with what Ms. Vortoran also just mentioned about picturing the goal, whether it's the language of love or whatever it is that we want to have as, a, as an aim. But of course, to reach the goal, looking back to picture our origins and know confidently who we are before we're able to partner necessarily or reach out in trust and confidence to other, other groups. Um, thank you both very much. In the chat, uh, anyone who would like to re uh, lo locate the links, they're right there. In a moment, we're going to have an opportunity to give uh, some feedback and some thoughts on these papers and also on the question which uh, Dr. Meath put forward about the kinds of partnerships and the kinds of activities that we think um, would be appropriate to build on this knowledge. Um, we'll be divided into about four groups. You've already expressed which preference you'd like uh, to discuss. There will be Chatham House rule within the group. It will not be recorded, so please feel free to speak freely. And in each group, we'd love to invite one person to uh, eventually come back to plenary and give us the two points that you feel were most significant to share with the group so we can end with a little group discussion before the end of the event. I hope that's fine. 
I will therefore, as it were, dismiss us into our groups and look forward to seeing you on the other side in half an hour to 40 minutes time. Hello, welcome back. And thank you very much for staying and for taking part in these discussions we've just had. Um, I hope they were fruitful. They were certainly quite brisk. So thank you very much for your patience as we kind of drove you rather um, um, yeah, briskly through, the, through, these, um, through reflections on these papers, which are of course extremely detailed and there's a great deal more that could be said about them. Um, in order for us to benefit a little bit from the discussions that have been had, it would be lovely to hear from the groups individually. Would it be possible therefore to put somebody on the spot and to ask what's been said at one or two points only from, for example, group one, and then we'll move through the different groups. Would that be possible, group one? Could somebody give us two points? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. And I would hand over to uh, Imam Yahya Balavicini. Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. And thank you for this very interesting occasion. Uh, our group, uh, I think, uh, um, has the main two points would be the first one probably to have a also for the benefit of the juridical dimension uh, to consider uh, hate speech uh, also through the contribution or the lens of uh, freedom of expression. Uh, so that would be the first point to link and to consider uh, this through the challenge of freedom of expression of a religious believer in the context of secular society in the West or in Europe. The second would be intersectionality, to understand the complexities of uh, uh, every identity as a citizen, as a full citizen, but also as a believer in, in Europe, uh, in postmodern society. And the last point, uh, uh, although it's the third, I uh, would say uh, it was mentioned to care for each other as a incre uh, including narrative, uh, um, uh, in, in, or, or it, to be added to the hate speech uh, um, counter narrative. Uh, so, so to increase as religious leaders, the contribution of care for each other uh, as something that could be a goal uh, to prevent uh, hate speech. Thank you. Thank you very much, Imam Pallavicini. Um, noting very clearly the um, freedom of religion and belief context and the intersectionality. Thank you. Um, group two, what was it that you discussed? What are the things that you think need to be prioritized? And with I can I can jump in here. It's it's Renata. I'm I actually I'll I'll just point out the points because. We ran out at the very last second before we could nominate somebody. And then if I missed something, then um, if, uh, if one of the three other people could jump in, that would be great. So one of the major focuses in the, in the, in the conversation had a lot to do with media. Um, media came up several times and there was a lot of concern about the media. More research is needed on how the media reports on religion in general. And this also ties into the need for a media literacy training for religious leaders and actors. Um, to be able to, to better understand how the media functions, but also as a training on how to speak to the media. So to better be able to interact with the media without being uh, taken out of context. Um, another, another major point was uh, a need for common spaces to be able to work together as religious communities across religious communities, um, as well as religious leaders, to be able to tackle the commonalities of hate speech against different communities. And this tied into also the need of a, a training in general for religious leaders um, to on how to act against hate speech, because quite often religious leaders are overwhelmed on how to deal with hate speech in a very concrete manner. And possibly the third point um, would be that uh, the need for religious communities themselves to be a bit more open across religious communities, uh, as well as um, also uh, towards uh, government authorities. So first of all, majority religious communities need to reach out to minority religious communities to create solidarity. It's also very important for religious minority religious communities to reach out to, uh, in general, to show that they're open and they're not closed off in the society. 
there is a need in general to be able to implement these recommendations for authorities at all levels to bridge the gaps between civil society uh, and faith communities, as well as the gap between governments and faith communities. And one such example was even that, that the police can play that role. It can be other civil society groups. So I think those were the three major areas that, that came up within our, within our group. So I don't know if anybody has anything to add. Um, I would just leave it there. Thanks very much, Renata. That was um, brief and to the point. And I have to confess that I also have failed to um, uh, bully anybody in my group into um, speaking. We had a diffuse discussion into many different areas, but I'll mention just um, a couple of brief points. I think this idea of working in isolation is common. And of course, we were working on the paper to do with uh, using education to counter hate speech against uh, refugees and migrants. There's a feeling that if the whole of society is becoming more polarized, which is a change we currently see, then the education sector is one that is that struggles to act alone. Uh, on the other hand, of course, if it is hitched to politics via national or even urban level structures uh, and gets put into the wrong slot, for example, if it's inevitably put into preventing violent extremism or seems to target one community, that massively detracts from its effect and it will still drive people apart as opposed to achieving some kind of solidarity. Another thing that was identified in terms of needs is that at urban level or elsewhere, some voices are louder than others. Um, religious groups don't tend to have PR companies uh, and there is a need for people who can bring together different faiths under one hopefully quite eloquent um, group in order to lobby properly because interfaith voices seem to be more attractive than a single faith voice uh, when it comes to making requirements and requests from education. Um, I'll keep that very brief. Again, anybody from our group um, who feels underrepresented is welcome to speak out, as is everybody else, because now um, I'm you're welcome to open the floor to any other points and discussion. Uh, the question really is still, looking back at these wonderful and rich research papers, what would be the steps moving them towards implementation if we wanted to improve either partnerships or initiatives at urban level? And I open the floor to anybody who'd like to speak. Please either wave or raise your, your yellow hand. Uh, Imam Palavicini. Well, thank you very much for giving us all again a, 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 an opportunity. I just wanted to mention two concrete uh, European funded projects we are uh, sharing here in Italy on this issue. And uh, what comes out is that one specific focus on Muslim hatred uh, is uh, the abuse of discrimination on woman identity. Uh, so they are using uh, uh, the narrative against uh, Muslim women to target Islam uh, in a discriminatory uh, way. So I think maybe uh, in the next future, uh, um, a, a report on this specific issue where um, gender balance uh, or narrative against uh, uh, woman uh, and specifically Muslim woman or or it could be Hindu woman or Jewish woman's is part of something that needs to be uh, reframed and uh, analyzed to avoid this uh, abuse. I, I, I'm mentioning this because this is something very concrete and the, the, the solution we have found is actually to show through the, with the municipalities, uh, what uh, uh, concrete uh, uh, inter-institutional cooperations have been uh, set, for instance, in Milan or in Palermo in Italy, mm. uh, to counter this uh, discrimination and to help Muslim women to also uh, report if they are object of any kind of discrimination and violence uh, with a better knowledge, uh, awareness of the, of the situation. So just uh, a, a very brief um, experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Imam Palavicini. Yes, noting the link between anti-feminism or anti-women hatred and hatred of Muslims. Um, and definitely tying back into what the OSCE point was previously uh, concerning the lack of reporting. Thank you very much. Uh, Rabbi Glock. Uh, you're muted still, sorry, we can't hear you.
sorry about that. I want to carry on from what Yahya said, and I, and I think it is sort of a carrying on on this line. But in the UK, some of you might be aware that we have been very obsessed with Partygate, and I think there are very good reasons for it, very legitimate reasons. Uh, and and Boris Johnson has apologized, and now we've entered a very good debate if he's apologized enough or otherwise. What's this got to do with today's discussion? As we, as some of you might be aware, Boris Johnson made some very, very inflammatory, uh, abusive remarks about Muslim women. And he has never apologized. We, we haven't even entered the debate if he's apologized enough or otherwise, he, period. He has not apologized at all. And that is indicative of the basic problem that we have in society. And education, even though generally we think it's about children, and it's primarily about children because that's the beginning, the foundation of life, it's also about adults. We also have to educate civil society and our politicians about how to act in a civilized, appropriate manner vis-a-vis -vis women in general and against minority women in particular. Thank you, um, Rabbi Gluck. And I, I know you have been speaking in our group as well about the frustration in terms of the uh, the general, as you'd see, negative cultural trend and how hard it is to turn what I think you call the oil tanker of our society around to a slightly more productive approach. Um, education, of course, from our perspective, is something that can be uh, and should be uh, available to everybody at all ages and uh, spaces. And one of the things we hope we'll be doing with in partnership with the, the ECRL is eventually, and OSE, is creating um, capacity building materials which may help certain sectors to operate more confidently in this kind of potentially hostile environment, whether that's building relationships with other religious groups or, or with uh, other sectors which may not be as, um, as friendly or used to working in particular with, with FBOs. Um, I should mention here perhaps that this year as the second in, in the next cycle of our countering hate speech work, in addition to working on urban level, we are particularly interested in working with um, on how media and culture can influence um, hate and, and countering hate speech. This is a, of course, a quite a deep and complicated um, area and not necessarily one uh, which is always friendly towards um, FBOs, but that's an area we'd love to explore. I see two more hands up. I see uh, Professor Petkoff and I see Sina Verai, excuse me for pronouncing your name. Uh, Peter first, perhaps, and then Sina. Um, thank you, Francis. Good to see you again. Uh, yes, uh, I also wanted to appeal to you in kind of looking forward for the next stage of this project to remain open minded about how hate speech evolves in a way freedom of expression also evolves and our understanding of freedom of religion and belief evolves and how our strategic commitments as faith-based organizations in dealing with this also has to evolve. Uh, uh, five years ago, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia and Christianophobia were in the center uh, of uh, uh, imagining hate speech. Now, uh, with the beginning of war in Ukraine, Hate speech is mixed with fake news, with co contested narratives of what is culture, what is authentic uh, form of Christianity, authentic form of religion. And inevitably, this will have an impact in the way we think about hate speech. And uh, the more savvy we are in actually seeing the new challenges emerging, the better we're likely to respond as a multi-faith uh, consortium of uh, organizations which uh, uh, take those issues seriously. So I'm very uh, sympathetic to the idea that you're extending uh, your focus on culture, certainly linking hate speech with uh, hostile takeover of uh, religious sites or uh, mm -hmm. competing narratives of multiple identities of religious sites. These were all things which we could certainly de uh, deal with uh, in the future and link, link them up with our uh, broader projects. Thank you. 
Thanks very much for that reminder, Peter. And of course, um, it occurs to me that this morning we all heard that um, Elon Musk is making a big push to make Twitter even freer than it has been until now. Uh, as I've now thought about uh, possible areas where, where speech will have will develop and the concept of hate may be stretched uncomfortably. Sina, please, you're welcome. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Yes, you have, thank you. Um, and a thing that was quite interesting that we had uh, discussed and we have discussed in our group was um, looking at the commonalities of of uh, hate speech, and and it's true that it's there is it has so many the the same um, the same mindset of of prejudice uh, blocking ways towards a more united and cohesive society it takes different. Uh, forms it's it's against religious um, uh, groups it's against uh, gender or it's against um, uh, it could be different different types uh, uh, ethnicities and <clears throat> and when we think about education it seems like also um, we have to be trained to look at uh, human beings in another way and and uh, so how we can also have a uh, educational system that doesn't uh, that helps people um, look at what's common uh, within all human beings their uh, their uh, their capa the spiritual capacities or moral capacities or or the fact that all human beings are essentially the same and how to slowly have programs that can help uh, children look away from from maybe uh, um, yes look beyond the cultural or the the physical uh, manifestation of, of uh, what we see. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And of course, there's a great deal in faiths and in faith-based organizations which can inspire that. Although, of course, for religions as well, it can be quite challenging for certain kinds of identity or differentiations um, to, to be fully accepted. So that's something which I think can be learned in a very circular manner when it comes to education. Um, I'd like to thank you. In case there is any other comment, I'm happy to take it. Otherwise, I would simply like to wrap up by letting you know what comes next as far as we're concerned. And thanking you all very much for, for being with us for this afternoon, which was at the same time a culmination of some of the work from last year, but is also a bit of a launch pad for the work coming up um, in this one. That's because Kaiseed and ECRL, with the support of OC's ODEAR, uh, we'll be continuing this project on countering hate speech, both uh, heading for the European Policy Dialogue Forum, which will take place in Barcelona this November. There we hope to gather many different sectors as previously, particularly policymakers and uh, religious actors, leaders, as well as representatives of media and culture and refugee and migrant organizations to talk about what can be done to counter hate and to foster solidarity, particularly looking at the realms of media and culture and the arts and so on. Uh, and that's a conversation which we hope will build on what has been done last year in terms of all of this research into what has been done and look forward into some very uh, concrete and practical kinds of developments for partnerships and for new kinds of implementation at um, urban level. I should mention that coming up in June, we'll have a pre-workshop for the European Policy Dialogue Forum, this time held in Stock, uh, close to Stockholm, where, of course, we know there have recently been other difficulties in terms of, of uh, social strife, if we we'll put it that way. We hope that that will be an interesting and, and, and fruitful place to talk about solutions and, and, and uh, multi-stakeholder partnerships, let's say, for the best. Um, at the same time, the partners will be commissioning further research and we look forward to new policy papers, which should also help to boost, if you like, the research up towards the level where it can be implemented by different kinds of actors. And we'll be sharing information about that in due course. And of course, um, we would love to see you and to be engaged with you on the journey towards, if you like, Barcelona this year. So please do be in touch with us. We have learned a great deal from you in the last year and wish to continue to do so. And want to, as usual, commend you all for the different kinds of work you're doing to counter hate speech. Wish you the very best of luck. Uh, and, and thank you all for your contributions, both to our work and, and to the people who you're serving, who of course rely very strongly upon your energies and your efforts. Please do feel free to share the research papers further. 
Um, we'd love, of course, for them to be useful to the world. Um, if you'd like to fill in our evaluation form, we hope we can improve the events we offer to you and to others. And otherwise, we simply thank you, thank our partners, thank you particularly other writers, Frederica and Olivia, and wish you well. We look forward to seeing you in due course. Thank you, Francis. Much appreciated. And thank you all. Lovely to see you all, as Lovely always. Lovely to see you as well. All thank the very you. best. Shalom, Rabbi Gog. Thank all you. All the best, my friend. <laughs> Bye. Arrivederci. Bye.